lambat na itong na ito, pero sa dugo na itong ito. Sa mong babae para sila, bukpak, salbar pang sila. Kang sa mong mga padaba, ah, hali sa salog, oh, hali sa salog. Very black net but blood soaked Our fish hair woman Hair to save fish All our beloved From the river From the river This song is from my one woman play River River which I adapted from my novel Fish Hair Woman. This novel is set in the village of Iraya in Bicol. Now using her 12 meter hair as a net, the Fish Hair Woman Estrella fishes out the disappeared from the river, the corpses of the victims of the 1987 total war, a terrible time in our history that resonates with current events. The Fish Hair Woman saves the disappeared the victims of salvaging and extrajudicial killings, E.J. Case, whose bodies were dumped in the water. The fisherwoman saves them from invisibility by saving their bodies and stories and their river, the lifeblood of their community. So, as writer, I mythologize a historical event, that total war in order to save story, save lives. But my creative navigations of water and salvation come from something beyond me, much older. This is a humbling realization. When I was growing up in Bicol, our elders cautioned us that before we venture into a river, especially for the first time, we must ask permission. We call out, Makiagi tabi, tabi tabi po, please may I pass? So, we don't hurt that Taul Lipod, the spirit inhabitants of the water. We might step on them, and they might hurt us back, make us sick. So, we also call out to make sure the spirits allow us safe passage. It's a reciprocity of mindfulness as we venture into the space of the other. Note that what underpins this principle is the story of saving the other and thus ourselves from hurt, from harm. But Makiagi Tabe is bigger than humans and spirits being careful with each other. I argue that it is in fact an environmental strategy of our elders. Their cautionary warning is premised on care, saving our waters from harm. So we don't just bulldoze our way through it, so we pass with mindfulness of the fishes, the plants, the birds, the stones, the water itself. Because even these non-human and non-living things have spirits. They are alive. Nowadays, this ethics of passage, which I call the ethics of tabi, or the ethics of please, is a must to save our ecologically compromised planet. In Australia, it is common practice that before we start any presentation, we pay respect to the indigenous peoples of the land. If I were giving this lecture in Australia, I would open with, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and elders past and present. Note the word custodians, which means the carers of the land. And I must name the specific land or tribe when I call out this acknowledgement. I call out my respect to those who were here in this land before me. Now, note the parallelism between the two acts of mindfulness. Both are acknowledging the original inhabitants of the land, its indigenous peoples, its spirits, and the land itself. Both acts are underpinned by the story of who and what were here before all of us arrived. We are all umbilically connected with a deep past, the land and our planet. And so is our present creative navigation of story, our writing. So before I proceed, I'd like to call out 
to whoever and whatever were here before us and to all the spirits in this room, in this building, in this land. Makiagi tabi, tabi tabi po. Please, may I pass? Salvation and story are bound with each other in Philippine practice. Think of the shaman, the babaylan, the repository of the tribe's well-being and oral literature. The original epic chanters who saved and sang the stories of the tribe were also the shamans at the time tasked with safeguarding the life and health of the tribe. She or he is the healer storyteller. So, save story, save lives has always been with us since our ancient ones, wired into our psyche, embedded in our cultural DNA. Now the question for me is how does this wiring happen in my writing? Well, let us sneak into a scene from my novel, Fish Hair Woman. In this scene, the modern day shaman Pai Inyo, the arbolario and grave digger, is saving a life in a Santigua, an exorcism. It is the 1960s before there was electricity in the village of Iraya. It is evening, and six year old Estrella who grows up to become the fish hair woman, is very ill. She fell from a tree while playing with her siblings, Pilar and Bulodoy, a fatal fall. Now, Pai Inyo must save the girl from possible death. Watch this moment of healing storytelling. This is a longish excerpt, so I've abridged the text. There are several Navinas at his feet, also some Piedra Lumbre, white medicinal stones, then herbs, and the ashes of Oliva, blessed last Palm Sunday. Among his healing implements, the old man squats to prepare the red candle and the basin with water. He scans a tattered book of Arashones, his special incantations. He cups water, whispers it a prayer, then lets it trickle back into the basin. Where did you play this afternoon? By in your lights, the red candle. Orchard, Bulodoy Mambos. Which part? He lets the wax drip on the water. A ripple of wishes. I'm asking. It's Pilar who answers, <clears throat> her tone defensive under the atut atut tree, and she climbed up and fell, that's why. How, Pilar? How did it happen? The medicine man scrutinizes the wax hardening on the water, then murmurs an incantation, a ripple of fears. I said, how did it happen? Just fell, I think. Pilar stares at the wax. You think? The ripple echoes in her chest. Did you see anything unusual around the tree? Any strange mounds of earth? Some hovering insect? Something else hovers. What is it? I'm asking Pilar. Anything strange? No, nothing, Paino. And yet, here in her chest, this hovering tightness. The candle sputters a faint protest. This, seen anything like this? The medicine man points to the red wax floating on the water. In the candlelight, a splatter of coagulated blood or a red raft, oddly shaped. The spirit here, see this, it's a female spirit. Truly, truly, talagang, talagang. A young female spirit, a girl. I, my cruel god. Swallowing his despair, Pai Inyo begins to chant all the incantations that he can remember. Now, let us abridge this text further to its core to reveal something akin to Pai Inyo's practice. Writing. Have a look at this. Where did you play this afternoon? Which part? 
How did it happen? Writing is investigation. An interrogative practice, like by Inyo, the healer storyteller, the writer obsessively asks the crucial questions about her subject and reads the signs. If you want to write, you have to read, read, read. And it's not just reading text to inform your writing, but more so reading the world with acute senses and sensibility. Which part? The need for specifics. Details, details, details. What make your story come alive and real? Next, a ripple of wishes. Wishes. Writing is underpinned by the wish to make sense of lived bits and pieces, the signs, to write that story. And ripple? Well, writing is not confined to the self, and uh, it is always going outwards. Creative practice is not navel gazing. It's expansive and inclusive. Now, scrutinizes the wax hardening on the water. We are always trying to discern. What do I really see? Do I see it? What is useful? What is working? What makes sense? And what is plain self-indulgence? Discernment takes a lot of practice and discipline and awareness that the writer can also get it wrong. So one has to work with care at every point of the writing. Care. I always told my students in Australia, creative writing students, love your characters into being, including your villains, so they come alive. And do the same with your sentences. Love your sentences into being. But it must be love with a grit of discipline. Drop the lines that do not work, even if if you think they are your best lines, kill your darlings. Next, a ripple of fears. Always the trepidation. It might not happen. I can't quite make sense of it or find a word for it. The sentence is not happening. The story might never come into being. Writing is a beautiful, terrible affliction. Next, did you see anything unusual? Well, we keep telling the same stories over and over again, but good or great literature always sees or says something new, that fresh insight on the well-traveled paths. Next, something else hovers. What is it? Is it the muse? The Western idea of the inspiration, the muse, the winged angel, the muse. Or is it the Spanish duende? The poet Federico García Lorca's Duende, the force in the earth that surges up to the soles of the feet into your blood and ushers in your writing, your image, your metaphor, etc. Or is it simply a presence like white turtle, which we will conjure in a while? Well, whatever it is, it is what propels the writing into territories we haven't even imagined. Something else is happening to us and beyond us. The inexplicable magic of writing. It's something else beyond the writer and we can only humbly revel in it. Next, I'm asking Pilar anything strange. Writing is about making strange. Remember Shakespeare, Ariel's song from the Tempest. Full fathom fire thy father lies, of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that wear his eyes, nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. The ordinary and mundane suffers a sea change in the creative process and becomes more than itself. Stranger, richer. Next, this. Seen anything like this? And the medicine man points to the red wax floating on the water and in the candlelight, a splatter of coagulated blood or a red raft, oddly shaped. The spirit, you see this? It's a female spirit, talagang talaga. A young female spirit, a girl. Well, a sea change is transformation. Pai Inyo reads the signs. The red wax is blood or a raft, then eventually a girl. The shaman's prognosis, this girl's spirit, is what made 
Estrella Sick. So the storytelling and making sense of bits and pieces, the signs, finally comes together. The writer is now on a home run, but the job is not yet over. Finally, he begins to chant all the incantations that he can remember. Incanting, voicing the story. I will address this shortly, but first, have a look at what I've drawn from the scene of the Arbolario's healing storytelling. It is the story of writing. All writing is about writing. The text on the page reveals the story of our craft, the way we plot our story, flesh out our characters, choose our words, and compose our sentences, and handle language, which of course is at the heart of composing voice. Now, one of the most important elements of fiction is voice. Voice can make or unmake our novel. If you get voice wrong, the whole thing collapses. And when I work on voice, I always have two questions wired in my head. Who is telling the story? Who is speaking? Now, what are the voices of fiction? There's, of course, the authorial, authorial voice that sometimes intervenes, makes a little comment in the middle of the narrative. There is, of course, the overall voice of the author. Like you say, oh, Hemingway has a distinct voice. And it's wonderful. I love Hemingway. <clears throat> and sometimes you hear this appraisal of a young contemporary writer, and it's supposed to be appraised. Oh, you sound like Hemingway. Of course, when we're young, we learn and model from the masters. But what's the point of sounding like Hemingway throughout your career? He's already done it. Our job as writers is to find our own voices, and we do have our own voices. Now, there's also the narrative voice, not necessarily the authors that tells a story within the text. And there are, of course, the different voices of the characters in dialogue or in interior monologue. How to make sure, though, that these characters do not sound alike? Well, use vocal, what I call vocal gestures or mannerisms. Say you can give one character a favorite word that she keeps repeating, or phrases from the dialect of the region where he's from. Now, there are actually other voices aside from all that we find in the text. The voices of the unsaid. The voices of the spaces between words. They could speak as a repost in your head, as you read, or they could sound themselves suddenly and snag your reading, making you pause and hear the words in another way. Now, if I were to visualize this, it's like the printed text is the landmass, and the spaces between words, the printed text, are all water or air, interconnecting the land or flowing over it, giving it an otherness, sometimes even an otherworldliness. Now, all the voices harmonizing together in the story give us the overall voice of the text. So the third question that may be asked is how will this book, this text, this story speak, sing, play in my reader's ear? There are three crucial things to listen to in trying to get the voice right. And one should listen to them as one would listen to music. First tone, the color of the voice. It's the attitude or complex of attitudes conveyed and expressed through language. So we should ask, what is the tone of this text? Or what is the tone that I'm after? Is it a melancholic tone, an ironic tone, an irreverent tone, or a contemptuous tone? Then there is register. Is it formal, colloquial, erudite, writerly register that I need? Voice makes character, and the character's vocal register is determined by his or her social, economic, and cultural background. Okay. You cannot give an educated and erudite voice to a farmer who has never gone to school. However, you can give him a wise voice that knows the voices of the land where he has been schooled. Vocal register reveals character. Finally, pitch is the emotional pitch. 
the intensity of the emotion that you are trying to convey. Now, these are all writerly considerations that you learn in a creative writing or literature class, but for me, there is something older that directs my listening to and finding of voice. It is the flow of the voice in Pinoy oral tradition of storytelling. I won't show you the printed text to illustrate this. You just have to listen to the voice of the text. A mythical tale. Once the turtle was small and blue-black, shiny like polished stoves. It was an unusual creature even then. It had a most important task. It bore on its back the dreams of Elias' dead children as it dived to the navel of the sea. Here it buried little girl and boy dreams that later sprouted into corals which were the color of bones. After many funerals, it began to grow bigger and lighter in color. Eventually, it too became white, long white. This was Lola Bashun's story told in a chant. Munya na bangi pangatulugan ta kipawikan Duyan sayang lipong Kasing puti kang buto Munya na bangi pangatulugan ta kipawikan I'll bring you a turtle tonight Cradle on her back Bone white I'll bring you a turtle tonight So From the river in Fisher Woman We flow to the sea in my short story, White Turtle. In this story, the Filipina epic chanter and shaman, Lola Bashon, chants the story of the White Turtle at the Sydney Writers' Festival. She is in a panel of writers, but she has no book. And some of the panelists and the audience wonder why she was invited to a Writers' Festival in the first place. Now, this short story is three-pronged. First, is an affirmation of oral literature or oral storytelling as equal to the printed text. Second, it is a post-colonial argument on how the rationalist West relates to the indigenous. And third, it is in fact the story of storytelling and writing. Why? It's about saving the dreams of the dead, dreaming up the white turtle, transforming it into the whiteness of bones, in effect, the magical transformation that we hope for in our own writing. Again, let us enter the core of the text and read the signs. Okay. These first four lines reveal something that I realized only now. White Turtle, which I wrote in the 90s, is in fact the story of my writing umbilically connected with Filipino traditional storytelling. It's orality, myth-making, border crossing. So, bodies are always in transit. This border crossing is actually from the past to the present, from the real to the magical. So bodies are always in transit. And actually in the shamanic world, there is no need for border crossing from the real to the magical, right? Because for shamans, the magical is real. This principle is at the heart of the literary genre of magical realism, how my writing is often categorized. Magical realism is fantastical, but it is not fantasy genre. Magical realism is a form of realism. It is grounded in the shamanic belief that the magic is real. So for Lola Bashun, the white turtle coming to a writer's festival is not magical, it's just business as usual. The white turtle is real in her world, in her culture. Also, the magical in magical realism is used for the survival of the tribe. Again, aligned with the practice of the shaman. As well, in magical realism, the magical is metaphorical. Moreover, it's a post-colonial strategy. But I will need another hour, hour, whole hour lecture to discuss magical realism. So let's leave that now and proceed to orality. Lola Bashon's story told in a chant, the power of spoken language is the power of incantation. 
say to the universe, so it happens, it becomes, it appears, even at the writer's festival obsessed with the primacy of the printed page, the book. Listen. Munya na bang ipang atulong ang takipawik? Haan? Do yan sa sayang likod, kasing puti kang buto. Munya na bang ipang atulong ang takipawik? Haan? The warmth in her stomach made double ripples as she began to chant again, filling her lungs with the wind from the sea and her throat with the sleep gurgles of anemones. Her cheeks tingled sharply with salt water. I agree you at her. She sang softly at first, then suddenly raised her volume, drowning the chatter in the foyer. Three harmonizing voices reverberated in the room with more passion this time, very strange, almost eerie, creating ripples in everyone's dream. All book signing stopped. People began to gather around the chanter, and by the time the main door was pushed open from outside by a wave of salty air, the whole foyer was hushed. An unmistakable time pervaded it. See me. White, white, oh look! Beautiful white! The little girl saw it first. Its bone white head with the deep green eyes that seemed to mirror the heart of the sea and the wisdom of many centuries. So, orally conjured by the healer storyteller Lola Bashon, the white turtle enters the room at the Sydney Writers Festival. The chanter's story is saved from invisibility amidst a Western audience doubting her currency as a storyteller because she has no book. They suddenly see the white turtle. It's myth making. Have a look at the first three lines. Once the turtle was small and blue-black, shiny like polished stones, dreams that later sprouted into corals, which were the color of bones. After many funerals, it began to grow bigger and lighter in color. Eventually, it too became white, bone white. I grew up with traditional Philippine myths, so inevitably I keep on myth-making in my own writing, especially in these watery stories that I'm discussing. Myth-making involves my sense of once upon a time, of noong unang panahon, myths and history, happening in my contemporary creative practice. I sense something of the past crossing over to the present, where I see something, and this something eventually becomes something else, transformed into a white turtle, a story on the page. A fluid border crossing, a magical watery flow from the past to the present, and from Nadama to Nakita to Nagin. So, from Nadama sensed the presence to Nakita saw the corporeal presence to Nagin, which was sen what was sensed and seen became something else. And as you can see, this echoes the movement of the Arbolarius reading of the signs in the water in Fish Hair Woman. Remember, he sensed ripples. He saw the wax hardening. He saw blood, a raft, then the girl's spirit. Let me be more specific about the shaman's influence on my writing White Turtle. In the 90s, I read this book entitled The Soul Book, Introduction to Philippine Pagan Religion by Father Francisco Demetrio, the writer Hilda Cordero Fernando, and the anthropologist Fernando Cialcita. I was struck when I read from the book about Lyle Watson, who has studied the biology of the unconscious. You see, he had this experience on a remote Indonesian island. Listen, I'll quote from the book. He wanted to see the giant of all sea turtles, the rare leatherback, particularly in his female form. After searching in vain, he mentioned his interest to the local seer, and that's the shaman, who promised, I will dream one for you. Almost a month later, the seer invited him to come to a sheltered corner within the reef where he worked the water for 20 minutes with his fingers. Shortly after, a huge female turtleneck surfaced from the distance. I will dream you 
a turtle. And it appeared. The, this magical event from the book entered my very core. I was given a gift. The sea air's giant turtle, of course, is not white, though quite spectacular. But after a while, this turtle that I read about began turning white in my consciousness, as if I were extending the seer's dream. Then it transformed further, becoming a funerary attendant to dreams of dead children, which turned into corals, bone white, which also became the patina, the color of this amazing reptile. What was happening then? I was unconsciously mythologizing, myth-making, fleshing out an old story, giving it an even stranger patina. Well, I could not help myself. I was caught up in this chain of gift-giving and the white turtle appeared. The shrimp story happened. Note the fluidity, the wateriness of the border crossing from different dimensions of time and space and culture. And note how bodies are always moving from one dimension to another. So when we write, even as we apply lessons learned from reading texts, from creative writing and literature classes, from literary meanderings in our head, we must never leave the body behind, the flesh and bones of the lived life. Remember, as creative storytellers, we are propelled by a community of bodies, both human and non-human, as we create. Storytelling is not lonely. We have the bodies of the present and the past, even the deep past, our ancient ones, as well as the bodies of the flora and fauna, of the land and waters, the air, ushering our consciousness towards new stories and ways of storying our planet. And the story that we create must also be returned to this community of bodies to facilitate the storytelling of the next generation, to contribute to the culture making of our community. Culture, you know, is like water. Culture is lifeblood that helps our communities survive. So our communities are not forgotten, so they are not erased. And the stories that we tell are integral to the ecology of our culture. So, this is what I always say, especially to young writers. Do not compartmentalize your practice in a little box. Uh, you know, saying, oh, I'm writing for myself. I want to get published. I understand that. I want to twin the palanka, etc., etc. Don't get me wrong. These ambitions are valid. Writing is an ambition, and it is an industry. But let us not lose sight of the fact that writing is more than this. Writing storytelling is a continuum and we and our stories are fortunately blessed to be part of this flow. Now let's recap the heart of my main proposition, Safe Stories Save Lives, underpins traditional storytelling and creative writing. At this point, let us hear from storytelling theorists Norma Livo and Sandra Ritz. Perhaps because of the organization of the human brain, we tend to see story all around us and are inclined to story memory as a natural act. Story is in everything because we put it, see it, expect it there. Story is a mental program or structure, a way of organizing and understanding something. Story might not be outside the body, but inside it, an artifact of thinking. Now, in the 90s, after reading that Livo and Ritz quote, I wrote in one of my early lectures, story is inside the body. Organic as our cytoplasm, mobile as our limbs, easily transportable. Each of us has our in-house storyteller for our ears alone, organizing and clarifying our ongoing experiences. Well, cytoplasm is fluid. It's composed of our waters, salts, and proteins. By the way, all of us are 50 to 70% water. Let's not forget that. Perhaps that's why much of my storytelling is watery. My insights recognize its skin outside and flow into it. 
and my body goes with it. Story and storytelling, mobile as our limbs, easily transportable. They cross borders. Water always finds a way to seep into or break through even the most impregnable walls. One can never keep the consciousness watertight. Now, border crossing and water are crucial in my latest novel, Locust Girl, A Love Song, which some readers find so alien to my previous works, but it's actually a logical flow on from my past writing. It's still mythical, fantastical, but this time set in a dystopian future, even as it is very much about our contemporary urgencies. In this novel, the planet has dried up because of endless wars, which is happening today. It's now, the planet is now mostly desert, except the last green home on Earth, the Five Kingdoms, from and where all, and in these five kingdoms, all remaining resources are controlled and consumed by an elite community. And the five kingdoms is protected by a border wall. And outside, hungry refugees live in makeshift villages or roam the desert trying to cross the border in order to save themselves. The scenario is apocalyptic. In a mostly waterless planet, two children <clears throat> Two girls, maybe about your age, you know, if you're in year 12. Yeah. Uh, two girls, Amidia, the locust girl, and her friend Binabi, both refugees, walk the desert to find water, food, and home. Let us walk with them into a cave where they think there is water because they can hear it dripping. And inside, they find a pool of water, but it is salty. And here they meet Chocholi, the indigenous woman of the cave, who does not stop crying and telling her story. So, let us listen to Chocholi's story. Once upon a time, my cheeks were dry. My eyes were dry. Once upon a time, I had a husband and two children, a boy and a girl. Once upon a time, their cheeks were dry. Their eyes were dry. She went on and on. With those many once upon a times, perhaps Chocholis was a time so old, it was before anyone knew there was such a thing as time. But our well was not dry. Yes, we had a well once upon a time. Our whole village could drink once upon a time. Even our animals, it was green once upon a time. Then the good men and women came to our village once upon a time. They came to tell us we had too much water and we were wasteful. We had to save water for the future. So they built pipes into our well and our water disappeared. It is not set in the Philippines, but it still draws from Filipino traditional storytelling. Once upon a time, no unang panahon is encountered over and over again, the past, the indigenous, the sense of myth crossing over to the contemporary reality of the colonization of indigenous people's lifeblood water. The five kingdoms built pipes into our well and our water disappeared. Let us continue Chacholi's story. Once upon a time, the good men and women said they were the keepers of water. Once upon a time, they said that our water was somewhere safe now for the future. And they promised to send us just enough water so nothing would be wasted. So once upon a time, there came barrels of water which we had to share. But there was never enough and our well was completely dry. Then the barrels stopped coming. The good men and women forgot their promise. So our village began drying up even the wombs of our women. Her tears dripped over our bodies into the pool where we stood. And it hit us. This was Chocholi's water, unstoppable in its gripping. Land dries up, wombs dry up, but tears, Chocholi's water resists decimation 
and continues dripping. Trocholi has wept out a pool of tears because of that history of colonization that led to the death of her home village. She's the only one left now, crying nonstop, telling this history, saving it from invisibility. She will not allow it to dry up. Let's continue. Once upon a time, as our village turned brown, our animals began to die. Then our children. The cave was awash with sound and too much once upon a time. Each of her words became like dripping water. More notes added as her story went on and the locust in my brow began copying each note, playing it over and over. I thought my skull would split with this invasion. I had to stop her. My wet arms reached out again towards her face. I wanted to plug her mouth, her eyes, but quickly I shrank away. No eyes, no eyes. I wept, I wept them out, find them in each side. I wept, I wept them out, find them in each story. Each of her words became like dripping water. Word equals water equals story. They are aligned sounds that must be heard. The weeping and storytelling must continue through the present time lest we forget. But in the process of eternal weeping, Chocholi has wept out her eyes. She is blind now. There's nothing but empty sockets on her face. However, we will find her eyes in each of her stories. And these eyes will look back at the colonizer unflinchingly, will keep reminding them, this is what you have done to our people, our water, our land. Locust Girl, a love song, is full-blown fantasy. But at its heart, it is still myth-making about the consequences of the colonization of peoples, resources, land, and the wars fought over resources and territory. The result? Climate change and a global refugee crisis. The novel is futuristic dystopia, but umbilically connected to history and to the present condition of our planet. Different times and spaces flow into each other and arrive at the fatal prognosis, if we are not careful, a waterless planet. Now, the story is not specific to the Philippines or any geography or culture. This is everyone's story. Its intent is global and planetary. But the orality of Filipino storytelling remains. This short novel is threaded throughout with love songs sung by the locust in Amidea's brow that she is the locust girl. And her locust the song serves as a compass that guides her to the dryness towards home. And what is home? It is the site of care and love among peoples from different cultures and geographies, multiple selves and others in the planet, and not just among humans, but also between the human and the non-human. It is the ultimate border crossing, girl, and locusts come together, becoming one body in this odyssey towards being safe in the company of others. And this safety is home. So on a girl's brow, the locust sings, A seed for a song, my dear, and oil to grease the throat, but I will find you safe, breathing yet, breathing yet. Seeds, oil, water, song, story are resources that must not be stolen or colonized but harnessed to keep the other, the kapwa, safe. You see, the phrase climate change can mean something else other than dire or desperate. It can also mean something about changing the climate of our sensibilidad our sensibilities, our worldviews, and our relationships with each other so we can save life. 
it's not even about saving our life now, but saving our kappa, the other's life. And we find this life breathing yet in the throat from where songs and stories are encountered. There is a postscript to this lecture. I'd like to say, but it is not enough to tell a story. One has to enact salvation in the lived life. What does the story that we write do for actual bodies that are suffering? Actual bodies in the firing line, when sometimes they cannot even read or write, denied of the basic right to literacy, denied of education. Well, we could spend a whole year discussing the ethics of the writing and reading practice interrogating our position or positionality as we say in relation to the life that needs to be saved you know we always say oh we have to empathize feel for the other and we say what does empathy mean we put ourselves in the shoes of another person the shoes of the suffering being but i always say remember they do not become your own shoes hindi mo sapatos yan excuse me you should know your position in relation to the one suffering. You are still other. So uh, this is something that we have to keep on thinking as we tell our stories. Now in the Philippines, Australia, and Canada, I organized and facilitated community arts projects premised on safe stories, safe lives in relation to the environment, mostly on water as resource, culture, and also as risk in times of devastation and because of climate change. We know water is a risk in this land of typhoons, right? So as artist and teacher, I facilitated the storytelling of those impacted by water urgencies. But I always realized my inadequacy because I did not have the infrastructure, especially the funds, that could enact their stories in order to save lives and livelihood. And my applications for project funds hardly succeed. I always got rejected, so the project did not flow forward. And the community always got disappointed. Very frustrating. Now, sometimes local community advocates attempt linkages with local governments, LGUs, and organizations offering the gathered community stories as crucial material that must inform policy making. Remember this. You who will become the policy makers of the future, or probably are also the policy makers now. Policy is the most important story that affects all our lives. Policy is narrative, policy is story. Now, among the projects that I did with local facilitators was in Tacloban, after Hayan. It was a pre-Christmas drawing workshop with children survivors of Hayan. In 2015, we visited the Kabalawan Transitional Shelter in Tacloban, where many families were housed after Hayan. We asked the children to draw their Christmas wish. They drew stories of loss and salvation. Here is the drawing of Cassandra Faith B. Marie, a 10-year-old girl. Note the aptness of her name, Cassandra. Cassandra was a seer in Greek mythology. She could foretell the future. Now here is Cassandra's foretelling. Gusto ko sama sa kaming pamilya. I wish we're together as a family. This is the story of salvation. First, have a look. First, save Papa saves someone from drowning in the ocean. And second, Mama and the youngest are safe in the house. And the two sisters, finally, and brother are at school. Para lang. Life is safe and normal again. What a discerning eye for a 10-year-old. First, save the body from drowning. Second, restore it to its family in a safe home and then let the children return to school. The child Cassandra sees the practical infrastructure of salvation after a devastation brought by water. First, immediate disaster response, then sustainable livelihood, then literacy, hopefully ecological literacy. Now let's go back to Greek mythology. Remember, when Cassandra foretells the fall of Troy, she is not believed. So Troy is devastated. Now. When 10-year-old Cassandra drew this story, it was two years after Hayan. And she and many other children and their families were still living in a transitional shelter that did not even have 
running water two years after the disaster. So, telling stories is not enough. The told story, the vision, needs to be believed and enacted to save lives. I wrote a poem in honor of Cassandra and her vision in my latest poetry book, Accidents of Composition. The poem pays homage to her vision, then problematizes it. But the question is, will Cassandra be believed? Now here is Cassandra's poem. Cassandra after Hayam. For Cassandra, fate be Marie, 10 years old. Your composition, a Christmas tree with stick figures holding hands. Your caption, gusto ko sana I wish we were together as a family. Drawn in crayons and labeled first. First light after the storm. First sight after the dark. Two dimensional on Manila paper, a still, born from the frequency of storms. But there are movements, other dimensions. What clarity of vision, Cassandra. You round up your wish, guide our eyes towards its logic in the next frame. Stick figure named Papa at the foot of a ladder, raised, hinged to the wind, and at the top rung, a bucket, unfurling a rope tied to a foot, vanishing into the water labeled Daga, ocean. How efficient. Papa, ladder, bucket, rope. How simple your mechanics of salvation. Then above his head, another Christmas tree, now an arrow, guiding the eye to the house with two figures. Bunso, youngest, and mama, lest we forget, salvation is completed in a house. But the eye unwittingly moves to the next house, Paralang, school, inside three figures also named, lest we miss them, ate, sister, huya, brother, ate, sister. What wisdom in testimony. No child is safe without a family, a house, a school. Such is your eye for detail, the logic of your first sight. A Christmas tree with stick figures holding hands. I wish we were together as a family. We look at them, but do not feel the grip of flesh, the stronghold of a wish. It's just paper, a child's drawing. So who believes Cassandra? Ayan, landfall, 8 November 2013. March 2016, more than 100 children still living in transitional shelters. The pledge of permanent housing composed and recomposed month after month, storm after storm, as Cassandra turns her sight away from the ration crayons and looks in the eye another incoming landfall. This poem bears the weight of its inadequacy. Like heavy stone that blocks the flow of the storytelling of lived lives. Yes, the poem got published in my book, but does it say the Cassandras and the children at the forefront of devastations? So here is a challenge for all of us, now and in the future, who have and maybe can have the means to create and harness the infrastructure that facilitates the flow of the story. And what is this flow? It is no longer simply save story, save lives. It must be save story, enact it to save lives. Just marvelous. Marami Salama. Thank you very much for listening.